You know what we saw, children, mothers, all stuffed in a van like cattle. And and you and this is this is where it came to head with me because that smell, the people, that energy, it brought me back to my escape. First of all, this is my voice. I'm Tim Green and I have ALS. This podcast is not about ALS or living with disabilities. I don't want you to feel sorry for me. I don't feel sorry for me. I am a father of five with a marriage that's lasted for over 33 years. I am a number one New York Times best-selling author of 41 books, an NFL first round pick with an eight year career. I worked on TV for Fox Sports, Good Morning America, Court TV, and Extra. I've hosted BattleBots, A Current Affair, and Find My Family. And I am also a practicing attorney. In this podcast, we're diving into real-life stories. From triumphs to trials, we'll explore the extraordinary in the ordinary. Join me, Tim Green, and my son Troy each week for real conversations, laughter, and insights. Because life is a journey. And everyone's got a story. My voice in today's episode is powered by Eleven Labs. To Lamb, let me just say that it is an honor to talk to you. You are truly a hero. You are also on the short list for the most dangerous human on the planet. You were one of the youngest Green Berets ever at only 21 years old. You are lethal with your hands, feet, any kind of weapon known to man, and most importantly, your brain. You have a fascinating and rich story chronicled in the book, The Way of Ronan, which I highly recommend. Troy and I both read your book and were speechless when we finished it. I have to say, again, it's a great honor to have you on our podcast. Thank you. Thank you for having me on, Tim. Can we begin before you were even born? Can you please describe what your mother and your entire family went through when America pulled out of Vietnam and Saigon fell to the communist North Vietnamese? You know, I want to start with the story of my grandfather. You know, my grandfather, he walked out of the tyranny of communist China, you know, when he was 12 years old. He walked out and if he was caught, he would have been sent to the labor camps where he would eventually die. But yet my grandfather walked out of China and he went to this um, river where there was floating pieces of driftwood. And he swam to the nearest driftwood and he said, wherever you take me, I will start my life. And it took him to Vietnam and where he was rescued by his adopted parents, his future adopted parents, who saw a little boy and raised this little boy as his own child, right? Their own child. And my grandfather ended up marrying their only daughter. And I want to explain to you, in the Vietnamese culture, you know, there's arranged marriages. So for a father to pick his daughter, his only daughter to marry this this boy who was my grandfather, who eventually became my grandmother. And then that was a story of how we became our family. And there was nine siblings. Okay. My mother was uh, one of the siblings. My father was on that side and my, my birth biological father. Where I'm going with this is my parents were born in war. They were born in the Indochina war when the French was trying to colonize. They too suffered and they, they were oppressed their whole lives. And when the Civil War happened between the North Vietnamese and the South Vietnamese, the North Vietnamese eventually it grew their forces and, you know, we, we found ourselves in full Civil War and Americans were there trying to fight for, you know, the independence of the South Vietnamese from the North communist regime. Unfortunately, the, the Americans, they left due to political, uh, reasons. The Vietnam War was not a popular war. Um, there was, uh, and the reason why it wasn't a popular war, you go back in history, is because news reporters, up until then, the, the military would censor everything. World War One, World War II, Korean War, they would censor all the news. It was now, they're 
exercising the, the First Amendment, freedom of speech, they started employing uh, civilian reporters over to, you know, Vietnam, and they painted their picture. And, you know, the, the political repercussions came out of that was it was not a popular war. Americans pulled out of uh, Vietnam. And that was where my story started. You know, I was... Uh, I was born on uh, a cold cement floor in the basement of Saigon Hospital. Uh, we were being we were we were getting hit by artillery fire from the North Vietnamese. It was their last surge before they take our freedoms. And I was born that morning on the hour of the tiger, on the year of the tiger. My mother was also born on the year of the tiger. And what that means in the Asian culture is that a tiger is a curious but yet brave, you know, creature. And in the spirit realm, the tiger is the only one that can roam between the spirit world and the physical world. It can move between the two worlds. And what that means is it could take knowledge for the spirit world. It could put it into this physical world. So that's the significance of the tiger. You know, the dragon is a powerful mythical creature, but it can never go into the physical form the tiger can. So in that, in doing so, you can make a difference in this world. You know, when I was born on that morning, or, you know, three months later, our freedoms were taken away. Our country, our freedoms. Uh, a lot of like Afghanistan, you know, I want to talk about Afghanistan. Afghanistan, when we withdrew from Afghanistan, you saw it played out on the news, right? You saw how desperate that situation was. People were willing to climb on airplanes just, just to save their lives, save their families because they knew what's going to happen once American leaves. And that's what that's what the South Vietnamese had to face from the North Vietnamese because the North Vietnamese did not just view us as the enemy. They viewed us as traitors of the people, right? So they were going to come and they were going to occupy, they're going to oppress, and they were going to uh, make sure that the communist regime holds power. And along with that, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people in political power were sent out to re-education camps. You know, I want to talk about these re-education camps. These are torture camps. Um, any prisoner that was put out there was forced into harsh manual labor. And any prisoner, you know, fell sick or ill due to those living conditions, they're quite brought out to the jungles and murdered. You know, like... Like what you saw played out on TV, people were leaving um, Vietnam any means possible. You know, after Americans left, some walked out to neighboring countries, knowing that some of these jungles, man, they were riddled with landmines. And if they were caught, they would have been sent to the re-education camps to die. Some uh, escaped on government planes during the uh, American evacuation, you know, the ones that worked with the Americans. For, for my family, you know, uh, we escaped by sea. You know, there, there was an estimated 400,000 refugees died at sea. And, you know, we... There we were, you know, we're loaded up on the bottom deck of a small little fishing boat escaping Vietnam. When your family decided to escape, your mom first approached your father. That didn't work out. She then asked your grandfather, he was both book and street smart, could you please tell us about how hard it was to escape and how blessed your family was to get out? People probably won't believe that the escape involved gold bars and a twist of fate. My grandfather... The one who walked out of communist China at 12 years old, he grew up to be an amazing human being, an international businessman, very good looking man with fashion, right? He would travel to Paris. He would travel to Indonesia. So he well versed man, very educated, 
you know? So at that time, uh, during the escape, he was an older gentleman at that time. And, you know, they, the North Vietnamese, they, uh, after our, you know, after they took over, the communist regime took over the, uh, the city of Saigon and South Vietnam, you know, we are oppressed. And when I say we're oppressed is, you know, the guards would work for the communist regime, but they were tasked with, hey, you're tax collectors, all right? And you're going to go and you're going to collect taxes. Well, some of these soldiers, they're going to collect more than what is owed. Human thing, right? Mm -hmm. So they would often kick in doors. They would loot through homes. Well, they went through my grandfather's home over and over, looting, just trying to find money. And they never found anything, but they saw this beautiful aquarium. You know, my, my grandfather had this aquarium. My mother talked about it. It was, it was huge. It almost took up the whole room. You know, as soon as you walk in, you see this aquarium and he would, he would get exotic fish and he would put in it. So amazing marine life. So the guards would just stand there and just look in awe. Little did they know that the frame of that aquarium was lined with gold bars. And that was the money. That was the currency that we needed to escape Vietnam. When, when I read the book too, and I, that, that part when they were coming in and looting and there's a part where your mom says, you can take our belongings, you can kill us, but I'm not afraid. I just thought of the, the, you're, you're obviously a fighter and you're a warrior. Your mom is obviously a fighter and a warrior in a different way. And then, you know, rehearing about your grandpa, when I read that about the gold bars line in the fish tank, I'm like, man where did this guy get it from? But now you hear he walks out of China at 12 floats at floating on driftwood. I mean, it sounds like you're, you're, uh, it's in your blood. It's in your DNA. Survival is in our DNA, you know, and it played out through my whole life, but survival, you know, so we took that currency and we escaped Vietnam. And I want to talk about the escape. You know, we, six gold bars for an adult, Three gold bars for a child. That's a human life. That's what we were worth. Just currency. We're, a human life was n worth nothing besides what the money that we can give, right? Was, currency was gold. So to escape Vietnam, first we had to pass the military guards that were patrolling the coastline for fleeing refugees. Any refugees caught were sent out to the re-education camps where eventually die. Next, we had to escape the pirates from surrounding countries, surrounding countries like Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand. These bandits would forcibly stop the boats. They would board the boats, kill the men, rape the women, and enslave the children. It was so easy because they knew that these refugees were leaving with everything they had on them. So easy that it brought in more pirates from other surrounding countries. You know, somehow we, we navigated past all that. You know, the, the captain of the ship, he was ex military. He knew some tactics. You know, he knew how to navigate. He knew the best route. Um, and he got us past the pirates. The next concern is the, you know, the tropical storms, man, in the South China Sea. Can you imagine those waves? I mean, you're, you're talking about hundred foot waves. We're, we're in a wooden fishing boat. Many people have died from those tropical storms on the South China Sea. Many have perished, but yet we, we, uh, somehow we survived all that, man. And we, we got into Malaysia where the Malaysian Coast Guard stopped us at gunpoint. They were not accepting any more refugees. They forcefully boarded our boats, roped it pulled us back out into the South China Sea when there was no more sight of land they cut the line they shot the motor and they left us there to die you know I want to talk about like survival you know and I also want to talk about like neuroscience for a little bit, right? Survival and neuroscience. I, would, I want to talk about that because from zero 
to seven years old, that's the program. That's when your subconscious mind gets programmed. Mm-hmm. That's your beliefs, your personalities. Man, I was three years old and I was left for dead. And you know, people were dying of dehydration because we were packing those boats with humans because the captain wanted to make money. So he took supplies, he took food. The only clothes that we had, like the only supplies we had on us, it was the clothes we were wearing. So we ran out of water. And then people started dying, right? So dead bodies were thrown overboard. Um, people started dying of sickness. A lot of them were older, uh, elderly people that couldn't make the journey. So they were, they were thrown overboard. Um, my mother said we drifted for nearly 30 days. You know, it's funny. It was, uh, when I was growing up, I always had the same dream. There was this dream that I always had where, uh, there was a crack in this wooden uh, floor and it was over me. The wooden floor was over me. It was like I was buried. And then somehow this light shone through this crack. And, you know, I had that dream when I was young and it, it manifested more and more when I was getting older. And I asked my mother, what was this? What is this? I had this dream. My mother, my mother said, clear as day. She said, we were drifting, you know, in the ocean in South China Sea and we were dying. You know, she carried poison within her belongings, and this poison was to be a minister to us when when our journey ends, so we we won't die a, a, a suffering death. And she debated on this poison. How much longer can she hold on? So it was nighttime, and, you know, we're drifting, we're dying, and apparently a, a, a search light from a Russian supply boat hit our boat it was it was a beacon and it hit our boat and that's the light that i saw that went through the crevice of that boat hmm. i was three years old can you imagine that that amount of trauma it burned into my subconscious where i can still visualize it you know so anyways we we uh we were saved by a passing russian supply boat can you imagine that what are the chances? I, so you had a hundred people uh, in the book. It says the boat was really maximum capacity forty. You had roughly a hundred people on the boat. Did you ever ask your mom? I mean, out of the hundred people, do you know how many were still alive at that point when you were found? Roughly, there's a certain point of the story she doesn't talk about anymore. Got it. So you know they saved us. So they they pulled us individually onto the boats, and then they. Uh, Man, we're dying, right? So they, they probably stuck IVs in us. You know, we're, we're, we're barely alive at that point. You know, they're, they're pulling us out of the bottom deck of the fishing boat, urine and feces, soaked, vomit, fear, death is what they pulled us out of. So anyways, after a few days of, uh, rehydrating us and getting us back to life. They put us back onto the boat, drug us to the nearest uh, refugee camp, which was one of the southern islands in Indonesia was where they dumped us. And uh, we were met by uh, Indonesian security, um, took us to the, the refugee camps. My mother painted a picture of the refugee camps. It was near a beach, grass huts. There was a headquarters building. A lot of these grass huts in the jungle was uh, made out of like poncho liner, you know, blue tarp, rope. You know, they're living in the jungles. And, you know, I I want to explain to you in these refugee camps, people get murdered, raped, killed. You know, you have hundreds and thousands of these refugees in this small little ground and a lot of some of them are criminals it's a desperate survival situation you know so it, it's not guaranteed because we we were saved by by the ocean now we're going to live now a lot of people still die in the refugee camps 
So you, you get to the refugee camps and and really, I mean, kind of like you just said, you're still just in survival mode. It's not like you get there and it's better than being on the boat, but it's not like it's a good situation. Um, you and your brother are are doing things to help your parents, like gathering firewood, and uh, you have to go far from camp so you don't get uh, ro- it doesn't get robbed or, or mugged from from other refugees. And then ultimately one day, um, you know, your mom gets a letter in the mail. Can you talk talk about that moment? what that, I mean, what that must have felt like. You know, I don't really remember too much of the refugee camps besides mm-hmm. me running through the jungles, right? Where I had a little <laughs> floaty device, right? Flotation device, uh, those pool little toys. And I had that around my hip and I would run around the jungle and I would <laughs> jump into the water, uh, the oceans, uh, which is super dangerous because it was riptides all through, <laughs> all through that era. I was surprised I'm not dead, right? Um, that's what I really remember, man. I don't really remember the, the letter. I don't mm-hmm. really remember that day. Uh, and I also, and the next thing I remember was I was on the airplane and I, I saw the most beautiful flight stewardess I have ever seen in the world, right? Because I have never seen an American, right? With blonde hair, you know, and I was, I don't know, I think I was six, right? So, um, those little memories is what I remember, right? The orange juice from the from the ride uh, over from the refugee camps. But I don't remember my mom getting that letter, no. So for the listeners who don't know the story, can you talk just quickly what the letter was and, and what it meant for you guys? So my mother, so as soon as you get to the refugee camps, you got to end process as part of that. And then they have countries that you can apply your citizenship for. You know, there was a lot of countries that accepted, you know, refugees at that time. America was one of the countries that was very hard to get into. Okay. Um, just because of the checklist, you know, we got accepted by Australia. We got accepted by Canada. There was a lot of countries that accepted us, but my mother held on and she wanted to go to America. And the reason why is because she made a promise to her father that she would go to America and be reunited with her sister, you know, who, who lives in America. And I want to talk about, you know, my aunt, my aunt married a American special forces green beret during the Vietnam war. He was uh, American. He came over, he was a Lieutenant on the special forces, a teams. He was out in one of the G bases, uh, G bases is what we call guerrilla bases where we're working with host nation forces. We're four deployed into enemy zones where we're based out of, and we do combat operations in this four deployed area. Um, my uncle's G base, uh, in Vietnam got overran by the North Vietnamese. He was stabbed by enemy SKS in the rib cage by, uh, by a bayonet, left for dead. His whole team was wiped out, um, but he survived. He survived, and he met my aunt in Saigon Hospital, and she helped nurse him, and he married her and took her back to the States. So now she's in the States. We're in the ref she camps, and my mother is trying to reunite with her sister, Right off of a promise, and I I, I want to say this off of a promise. People were dying in these refugee camps. We we were living in grass huts, but my mother held on for a year and a half off of a promise. Mm. So after a year and a half, we uh, we were sponsored by my uncle, who was that American Special Forces Green Beret. He's, he's an officer in American uh, special forces. So, you know, his, his letter of recommendation counts. So he sponsored us. We came over to America. Um, we ended up in Fayetteville, North Carolina. Fayetteville, North Carolina is right outside of Fort Bragg. It's called Camp Liberty now, but it, back then it was Fort Bragg. The biggest army base in the United States, and it housed, it was the home of special forces, it's the home of special operations. So imagine the 80s, right after the Vietnam War, right? You had a lot of veterans that was walking around there, a lot of PTSD, a lot of mental uh, health issues that, that the military was not addressing at that point, nor did we even know that that was real, right? So, um, 
man, I, I felt it, man. You know, I felt hate. You know, I felt racism growing up. The Vietnam War, like I said earlier, was not a popular war. Um, during the 80s, um, if you guys, <laughs> Tim, you can remember during the 80s, there was a lot of like Vietnam War movies, right? Like a lot of war movies. And these war movies, man, they were saying a lot of racist names to these, you know, to, to the uh, North Vietnamese, the enemy, right? They would call them all sorts of racist names. And somehow, man, somehow they made it okay for my peers to call me all sorts of racist names in school. And, and it was backed by their parents. It was supported by her, their parents. You know, so, man, I, I felt racism at, at, I felt at a very traumatizing level. You know, it was not only was I picked on, I, I was, I was moved to the back of the class. I was told that I stunk, right? The racism you experienced at a young age was sickening. This was particularly impactful on Troy when we read about your experience at the grocery store. He couldn't believe it. Through it all, your mom reminds you, smile and be brave. I must say, she is quite the formidable character. She is. She is. Yeah, that, that story, if you, could, if you could share that story, I mean, when we finished that part in the book, I, I said to my dad, I'm like, man, what, what the heck? Like, this guy, this poor family can't catch a break. And I'm sure, you know, the, the guy that said it, it, well, why don't you tell the story so people uh, understand? So uh, we just moved out of my uncle's place. He helped us get established, the uncle, the special forces uncle, my aunt. Mm -hmm. And after, you know, living there for, I would say, four to six months, I think, we moved to a very poor part of town. You know, very poor part of town. And um, after living in this uh, part of town for a few months, my mother worked on getting her driver's license. So she was all happy. She She got her driver's license, you know. Imagine a refugee that lost everything, her country, her freedoms, everything she had. Getting a driver's license meant a lot to her. It's a sense of belonging again. I feel like freedom, really, to travel and move around. and Yeah. So, you know, she borrowed my aunt's car, a loaner, and literally she just drove right down the neighborhood, right, and um, to, to this uh, grocery store called Higgly Wiggly, right? And and we we walked in, and man, I tell you, you know, food as as far as you could see, you know, and that that doesn't mean a lot to many Americans. But man, when you're left for dead, when you're starving, you've seen bodies thrown overboard because of that death. When you starved at that level, I mean, food means the world, right? And my mother was so happy that day. She was packing the uh, the shopping cart with food. And, and uh, man, it was just, I was so happy. I remember I was so happy because I'm spending time with my mother and I love, I love my mother. And uh, we were coming out of the grocery store and this man walked up. And I still remember him to the T, how he looked, what he smelled like. And he walked up to me and I, I remember smiling because I always smile. And I smiled at him and he spit in my face. And he called me a fucking chink. I didn't know what just happened, but I remember the smell of that spit, that saliva. It smelled like alcohol. It smelled like vomit. I still remember today, hate. My mother was so upset, she 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 took the grocery cart and she hit him, she ran into him in the hip with the grocery cart. He fell over, he got up and ran. And um, I remember that ride back, you know, I was trying to process it and my mother reminded me how beautiful the day is. Hmm. Where do you think she got that spirit where it seems like nothing mm -hmm. nothing could even phase her, let alone bother her? I mean, everything throughout the whole story, through the escape, through the racism, through the challenges, she just always is, I don't know, she has such a good energy about her. Yeah, resilience, right? She always had it. Can you talk about when your mom gave you the box your biological father left you? 
What did that feel like? What was inside and how it inspired you? At that point in my life, my parents were divorced. I was living in my future stepfather's home. I was introduced to an extremely strict military upbringing. I felt abandoned by my father, couldn't speak to him. And my mother came to me um, one afternoon with a box and she, you know, told me it was from my father, you know. Um, I didn't know how to process it, but eventually I did open up the box and within this box there were four contents. It was four VHS tapes. There were, there were dub tapes, you know, written in Vietnamese and I, I couldn't read Vietnamese. Nine years old, you know, so I've randomly just picked out a tape and I put it into the VCR. It was um, the art of Budo. Um, Budo is the combat side of being a samurai. So in this VH VHS tape, it talked about Bushido, the way of the warrior, and it talked about the samurai ethics, Iaido, the way of sword and mind, and to be a, you know, to seek deep knowledge in all things, you know, the way of the warrior. And I, I want to explain this to you. At nine years old, I was so far from being a warrior. In fact, I was, um, man, I had a very low self-esteem. I had no friends. I was weak, undisciplined. I was lazy. And then this, this uh, code, Bushiro, broken down in seven virtues, you know, it's the pillars of Bushido, which is compassion, duty, honor, respect, loyalty, justice, right? So courage. So I realized that I wanted to be this warrior. I just didn't know how, right? And in the 80s, on top of that, like ninja movies and samurai movies, they were, they were a big deal. And man, I would love samurai movies, right? And I would watch these samurai movies daydreaming like how can i be a ninja or how can i be this because i was introduced to the samurai and i love the samurai but the ninjas killed the samurai so i got interested in the ninjas right but what this whole thing brought me was it brought me to the code of bushido the way of the warrior and because i had no friends right i would go to the local library where i would read about taoism and lao Tzu and and about the universe, right? At a very young age, 13, can you imagine? Trying to absorb the Tao Te Ching. <laughs> Trying to absorb, you know, Sun Tzu, the art of war. I, I was drawn to that life. Like I was drawn to the philosophy and this way of living. You know, and, and when I was a teenager, my mother and I would go to, you know, to, to visit the refugees so we could help the refugees. She would always give, you know, never forgot where she came from. Giving, compassion. And, you know, my stepfather and my, and my uncle, they were both Special Forces Green Berets. So I knew the mission of the Special Forces to free the oppressed. De oppressa libraire, to free the oppressed, from oppressed man to free man. God has given us one life. Why not do something great? All right. So at, at a very young age, I, I knew the path was going to be a Green Beret for me because the Green Berets were the, the ones that were going to go in and live with the indigenous force. Right? They're going to live with the people. They're going to fight for the for the people. They're going to fight for the people that were like my parents. Me, the oppressed. So I knew that was my ticket, right? So I started training. I started reading a lot of philosophy, a lot of uh, history books when I was young on, on the special forces, rangers, uh, understanding tactics, um, weapon training through my stepfather at a very young age, martial arts, very disciplined, uh, a life of very disciplined at a young age. But I had a lot of chores because my, my uh, stepfather was a, you know, we were raised in strict military upbringing. A lot of chores. We, we would get up early in the morning, do physical training before school. We would have a dress code, no blue jeans, you know, um, button shirts to school, slacks to school. We would have to type out our homework. 
instead of write out homework, right? So a lot of a lot of that, you know. At 16, uh, I started training for the Special Forces. So long distance running, I started changing my body into uh, an athlete. You know, I needed to be an athlete. I was I wasn't that strong back then, you know. So at 16, I knew I had a timeline. 18 was when I joined the army. So 16 to 18, I started my training and I started enrolling in wrestling, uh, football. I wasn't that great at football. I, I kind of sat <laughs> on the bench a majority of the time. Um, <laughs> but it taught me a lot of agility, you know, football. Um, to you around that age, I think it was right before you started the sports stuff, when you started changing your body, you're, you got, bullied and it was a particularly tough day and your uncle comes to you and he says do you want to be a fucking commando today <laughs> what did you think at that time i mean you're you're into this you're into that uh you know kind of that mindset where you want to be a fighter you want to be a warrior but you're not there yet and then your uncle comes to you can you talk about that so that was when i was 11 Oh, okay. And 11 years old, and uh, I was being picked on. I wasn't accepted. You know, I was told, you know, I smell indigenous, all, all of it, right? And on top of that, my mom decides to perm my hair, right? So I had <laughs> I had a perm. And in North Carolina, it looks like a uh, Jerry curl, right? <laughs> so I, w- I was being picked on all the time, right? And uh, my, my uncle would uh, – come and, and visit me here and there, you know, whenever he's in town and he wanted to take his little nephew to a Dairy Queen. And, uh, you know, I, that day I was, I was kind of, I remember that day I was kind of in my head, you know, feeling sorry for myself, no friends. And, uh, I, I think he knew. And then he said, you know, out of the blue, he said, you know, sometimes too, you know, you got to ask yourself, you want to be a fucking commando today. <laughs> And I looked at him, and he was in his little Volkswagen buggy, right there. He would fix up on the weekends, you know. He's shifting gears, going up the hill, and he's like, "You know, I'm 11. I don't know how to process that." And he's like, "You know, sometimes people are going to spit in your face, and they're going to tell you that you don't belong here. You need to ask yourself, you want to be a fucking commando." The days that your your bones ache and you, you feel it's about to shatter off the sheer load that you're carrying on your back, you want to quit. You need to ask yourself, you want to be a fucking commando. And you know, that that commando, and let me explain what a commando is a is a very elite soldier trained in in raids and ambushes, direct action, right? Very elite soldier commando. Um you have to live a life of discipline. You have to be brave, right? And at that point, I wasn't any of it, man. I was, I was scared. I was frail. I was, I had no friends, right? So when he asked me if I wanted to be a fucking commando, it, it shook me because uh, first, my, you know, we don't curse, right? <laughs> like that's that's bad. You don't you don't curse, right? and he was saying curse words, you know. But it shocked me so much. It rooted me where I'm like, you know, there was a point in my life after I read the Book of Five Rings, Misashi Miyamoto, about the samurai code and purpose and life. When I answered that question, yeah, I'm going to be a fucking commando. And it was it was a well thought out plan. Like I said, you know, I I, I remember saying I'm going to be a commando at 13, right? And then at 16, I started my training. After a summer of learning special ops fighting techniques and getting stronger, a few bullies decided to try to pick on you. In the book, you mentioned that it was unfortunate, but this time for the bullies. Yeah, there was a certain point when I was in high school where, um, you know, my training, my speed, my agility, strength training, it kind of just added up. Um and they picked the wrong guy that day because I was not in a good mood that day. But what that taught me was, man, I had some skills at that point, you know, and I could put it together. Uh, I didn't want to hurt them, but they were. They were they were put down uh, and really fast. So uh, that taught me that 
wow, this, this stuff works. Right. Um, <laughs> but I realized at that point after I hit them and, and, and hurt them, uh, I didn't want to inflict that onto people. Right. Was that the end too? Did anybody ever try to bully you again after that? Or was that? Oh it? yeah. 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 People try to fight me in the military. People still try to fight me today. Right. So, <laughs> um, it, it's just a part of my life, right? It's, it's the path of a warrior. I understand that. You know, but, um, yeah, it was just that day. Uh, it was unfortunate for them, you know. This leads us up to high school graduation. Your mom tells you how proud she is of you. Growing up, she told you that if you have an education, you'll never be oppressed. But when she tells you that she's going to cook you a big meal to celebrate, you tell her that you have other plans. But you did promise her that you would graduate college. So at that at that point, too, when you're, you know, you're, your mom is happy to celebrate graduation and you say, you know, I'm going with the recruiter over there. I mean, how did you, you knew already, obviously before that you had this all planned out. Did anybody else know in your family or was it just you? Was your, was your stepfather in on it or your uncle? Did anybody know that that's what you were going to do? No, not that, not that soon, not that early. Um, and, you know, like I said, you know, when, when I was growing up, um, you know, my mother never wanted me to join the military, you know, um, just because she was born in war. She saw she saw war at that level. My stepfather, he's been to war, you know, so not necessarily my stepfather, but my mother definitely did not want me to join the military. So I, um, before my graduation day, I, uh, took my, uh, GT, my ASVAB, uh, secretly. Um, I went to a recruiter, showed him my score. I qualify for any job. Right. And, um, I said, I wanted to be a paratrooper, an infantryman. And, um, they're like, you could be anything. And I'm like, yeah, that's what I want to be. Uh, so I already had the contract. I already knew what I wanted. So, um, you know, my, my basic training day was going to start. So why not get my career going? Right. Everybody else is just, you know, hanging out, partying and doing their thing for that summer. I, I needed to get my life going. I needed to be a warrior. At, uh, at that time, though, did you did you know? I mean, obviously, you knew it was different because the graduation, everyone's going and doing graduation parties and and you know screwing around, and you're you're heading to uh, to a military base. I mean, did you know at that time how different it was, or were you just so focused that it you didn't even notice it? I was, I was switched on. I had a timeline. That that decision was already made when I was thirteen. I was following through with that. Right. So I knew the timeline. I knew the, the sacrifices I had to make. You know, I didn't have that much friends anyway, so it didn't really matter. You know, I needed to get this thing going. And um, so graduation night when everybody was partying, I was at Fort Benning, Fort Benning, Georgia, looking in the mirror before the next day where did they shave my head, you know, <laughs> uh, for basic to start basic training. So, so you arrive at the, the airborne infantry and you learn a lot of hard lessons. You talk on the book, the, the mind games that they play on you. One of them that I just, every time I read, I read in the book a couple of times, I was telling people about it. I mean, it's just hysterical. I'm sure for you, it wasn't funny at the time, but looking back on it, when he's like, what are you looking at too? Do you think I'm sexy? <laughs> and you can't answer it. If you say yes or no, you're in trouble. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that's the setup, right? That's the setup. <laughs> That's hilarious. They granted you your wish and started you off in airborne infantry. You had to be ready to deploy anywhere in the world on 18 hours notice. This also meant you were one of the guys jumping from a plane. What was that feeling like the first time you saw the light go green and launched yourself out the door? So there's two type of airborne jumps, right? There's static line where you hook up a line and then you jump out and that line pulls your, your parachute open. And there's another one where you jump out, there's the parachutes on your back and you free fall, right? So the static line was what I started off with first. And I tell you, my first static line jump, 
I don't know. I thought it was going to be more. Like I thought it was going to be more adrenaline, right? It was just, okay, I floated to the ground very slowly, right? <laughs> right. So it, it wasn't that fun. And then when I got to the Airborne Infantry Regiment, they're strapping, you know, you got a hundred pound rucksack, a back, you know, those rucksacks, those backpacks on in between your legs, right? Because that's how you jump. And then you got your weapon. I had a machine gun, uh, a, you know, a squad assault, right? A squad assault weapon um, down my left arm, right? That's connected. So it's very heavy with the parachute. Dude, there's nothing fun about it. Right. And, and you're jumping in at two o'clock in the morning, right? A bunch around a bunch of hillbillies that's been dipping all day. Right. So you're smelling vomit. You're smelling dip, right? Your low level flight, low level is when the uh, airplane drops and it, it, it maps the earth. So it drops be below radar. So it maps the terrain. So, so imagine, you know, blood's rushed to your head, down to your feet. You're getting nauseous. Right. So those are the type of jumps we did. Uh, combat equipment 82nd because we had to train for real time operations, you know. Uh, and the last time they did that was Panama, uh, during that time. They were very successful at it, and that was their mission at the, na you know, at that national level. So we trained on it. It got really good. Um, for me, I, I went to Ranger school right off the bat, uh, getting to the, uh, the infantry unit, which is unheard of, you know, uh, when I say that it's very rare. To, to get a ranger school right off the bat. Uh, first, they don't trust you that you're going to make it. Uh, high washout rate in ranger training. Um, but I, I, I passed, I passed through ranger, uh, pre ranger and I went to ranger school, uh, when I was 19, graduated 19. And that put me on a fast track, uh, into special operations. So when you're, when you, you go through this, you know, brutal hike. Every other, uh, you know, every other newcomer drops out, but you. It's just you, you and the team. Um, you know, you and the more seasoned, experienced guys. And uh, you know, then somebody comes up to you. One of the one of the sergeants, I believe, comes up to you and says, or to the whole the whole group of the new the, the new recruits, and says, "Who wants to be a ranger?" Right? Yeah, the first sergeant. Yeah, the first mm -hmm. sergeant. Yeah, who wants to be a ranger? And you were the only one at that time. I don't know if it was brave enough or what it was to raise your hand and say that you wanted to. And uh, do you think that they were they were testing you to see if you could handle it, or do you think they were trying to almost humble you and, and break you and not like it wasn't even really supposed to, you weren't even supposed to pass that next test that you they were just trying to slow you down. I, I wasn't supposed to be there. I, I was uh, the Asian guy, right? Uh, I was called Chink in the company. Right. I was told I was nothing. Uh, and then for me to stand there at the final with everybody else dropped, um, the leaders, I don't know. The leaders had to see something in me, right? Because they invested money, they invested training, they put me in, in leadership positions after that, but they were pissed off because I left. As soon as I, I graduated ranger training, I did maybe another few months and then I applied for the long range amphibious reconnaissance teams. That was one of the things that, that um, I had written down, like when I was reading the book is every time you hit a milestone that people, most people I think would be like, Oh yeah, this is great. And slow down or, or smell the roses or just, you know, be in that spot. You were always on to the next thing so fast. I mean, I know obviously in the book, it probably makes it seem faster than it actually was. I know you spent a lot of time there and, and had a lot of uh, grueling, <laughs> grueling training and, and missions and things that you did. But it kind of goes back to my earlier question about graduation. Did you just have this plan set and it didn't, you were just on to the next step or did it kind of just fall into place? I mean, how did that all work out like that? Once I joined the army, it was about timing, right? So San Tzu, Art of War, is about timing and the terrain and environment situation. So I knew as soon as I joined the army, I needed to be qualified. I needed to get these qualifications. I needed to prove if I had it or not, right? And um, I was able to get those qualifications early on really fast. And I knew that because I knew it was a young man's game, you know? So I war game my whole career. I knew... That is a young man's game. If, if I was to get into these units, I had to do it in my twenties, 
right? I had to get in there before I get injured, before, you know, life, career takes over. So I had a lot of that uh, kind of mapped out in my brain. So when I went into the Army, it was kind of about timing after that, because for me to even try out for the Special Forces, I had to be an E5 in rank or had five years in service. But because I tried out for Ranger training and made it, that put me on a fast track. I made E5 in a year and a half in the Army, and that put me in Special Forces training at 20 years old. <laughs> That's crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so uh, before Special Forces, I went to the amphibious long-range reconnaissance teams where you had to go to Fort Story, Virginia, and train with the uh, Force Recon Marines, right, and then pass through their amphibious uh, training. Uh, reconnaissance school and then that brings us back to our our uh, our unit back at bragg where we deployed to uh support jtf6 missions in uh border uh stopping uh, you know drugs human trafficking coming across the border you were working with your lrsd team at the border trying to find drugs but what you find is something much much worse can you talk about this pivotal moment in your life we went down to JTF-6, so uh, linked up with the Border Patrol. I was doing atmospheric, so riding around as a ride around with the Border Patrol. They they stopped this suspicious vehicle. You know, they, narcotics is usually what they transport through. Um, you know what we saw? Um, human trafficking. Right. So, um, uh, humans, um, children, mothers, all stuffed in a van like cattle. And, and you, and this is, this is where it came to head with me because that smell, the people, that energy, it brought me back to my escape. And I knew why I had, I knew why, I knew what I needed to do, right? I didn't, I, it reminded me of my mission of why I joined the military. And I had to see that because I was content with the person I became, the position I was. But the original plan at 13 was to free the oppress. And that brought me back to my original mission, right? So, Right after that rotation in JTF-6, I rotated out, uh, applied for the um, Special Force Assessment Selection, and within months, I was in selection, trying out for the Special Forces. When I, when I read that in the book, my, my jaw dropped. I was like, oh, my God. I mean, what that at that age, what are you, you're 19 years old and you open the, you open the door and that's what you see. I guess for you, like you said, you were kind of born in it and, and experienced it firsthand. But man, when I was 19, if I saw something like that again, I would be, I don't even know. I, I, I didn't even know, you know, that how could you ever yeah. process that as normal? How can you, as a human being, how can we ever accept that? Yeah. That, that, how, how can another human tr being treat another human like this? You know, that's unacceptable. So, yeah, it brought me back to my original cause, the special forces, you know. Um, 97, I was 20 years old. I was trying out for a uh, special force assessment selection. Um, three weeks. Three weeks, right? It's it's hell. Three weeks. The last week is called Team Week. It's it's comparable to the Navy SEALs Hell Week, right? So a lot of guys drop out on Team Week. Uh, you're carrying loads up to 300 pounds on your back at times. Uh, you're malnourished, uh, sleep deprived. You're moving, right, as a team. And uh, any guy who falls back on the team, you're out, you know. So very, very hard. Um, we started off with 400, I want to say around 480 and we graduated with 80. I graduated with stress fracture, right? Um, and then I started my, uh, my Q course training. So Q course is a pipeline to get into special forces. Uh, for, for me, it was, uh, eight month, an eight month pipeline. Uh, 
with language training and uh, advanced uh, infiltration um, in SEER training, which is uh, prisoner of war training. But yeah, my my MOS, which is my job on the ATs, was uh, weapons and tactics. Um, kind of line <laughs> it, it line on what I was interested in, anyways, right? So um, after I graduated from the Q course, language training, um, I went out to Okinawa, Japan, where I was stationed on an uh, four deployed um, A team. Uh, I was on a uh, CSAR team, which is a combat search and rescue team. Back then, uh, the threat was uh, North Korea in, uh, in Asia. It's still a threat. Right? Things don't change. But they had no dong missiles uh, that can hit the United States. And we were uh, highly interested in that. Right. So, um, yeah, so a lot of that back then. And then uh, pilots would fly over reconnaissance. Uh, if they get shot down, they would send in A-teams like us to search and rescue them. So I did that. But I tell you, man, you know, you think about being on an A-team, like that would quench, like, I don't know, your your ego, right? <laughs> but it didn't, right? In fact, um I was bored on the teams, you know, we're, we're free falling, kicking in doors, swimming, you know, we're doing all the A team stuff. But, uh, in the afternoons I would bow into a dojo and I would, I would learn, right. My martial arts and I would study. And then the promise that I made to my mother about college, um, I would get up at three o'clock in the morning and I'll study. And, um, you know, eventually I graduated with honors top of my class, but, um, yeah, that was my schedule in Okinawa it was, uh, fighting the A teams deployment. We were gone maybe 10 months out of year at points. Right. Um, so when you, when you're in Okinawa, you're, you're talking about it very casually. Like, oh yeah, I was fighting and an A team and I was doing school. I mean, you were, you, you basically stumble into this underground fighting <laughs> circuit because <laughs> you see a sign on the side of the road that says tough man. Right. Can you talk about that first discovering that and, and, you know, wandering in there and what you, what that was like? So I would train, you know, I would train in Naha, Muay Thai, and I was training in Jiu Jitsu, uh, Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, uh, back then. It, it was starting to become very popular in the UFC in, in 98 time frame. Uh, about 99 is when I started fighting in Okinawa. So a lot, of, I was drawing a lot of that knowledge from USC and then the, the fighters in Okinawa. So I got wind of what the, the Marines that were fighting uh, this thing called Tough Man, right? It was at the field house, $250 for you win, Tough Man, right? <laughs> so I would go to Camp Foster uh, Marine Base, and that's where the uh, field house is at. And I would go grocery shopping at their uh, commissary. Uh, I would usually do it in the morning, but at this one, I remember I wanted to go diving the next morning because I, I go scuba diving. Uh, so I had to do the grocery shopping late that night. So I pulled up and there was this huge sign. It was flashing tough man, right? Field house. You know, I, 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 I want to explain to you, man, like I wasn't right in the head. And, you know, and I, I want to say it like I wanted to fight. And I wanted to hurt men and I wanted to go to war. Right. And, and, and I think it was a lot of my trauma that was pushing me, you know, to, the, to that. And I wanted to fight anybody. Um, I would fight guys on the A teams. Right. And nobody wanted to fight me because I, I would hurt them on the teams. And, you know, on the teams, we can't be hurt. We got to perform, right? We still got to operate. But I would fight. And what I love about the Marines, man, is they gave it. Man, the Marines, I love the Marines because they they wanted to fight too, right? And I tell you, man, they they gave they gave me that fight that this 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 uh, insane kid was looking for. Like, I was insane, you know? Um so I, I went in the field house and they were, you know, in this boxing ring. They had the, the big gloves on and they were fighting. And, you know, and then guys came out with these uh, open hand gloves. That was the first time I saw like you know, open hand gloves in a match. And I, uh, and I said, how can I fight? And they're like, well, you get your commander's approval. So I walked out, got my team leader's approval. Right. And I, next, next week I was, 
hanging out in a field house with this army t-shirt on that said Tory Station, Okinawa, right? Special Forces, right? And I walk into a Marine field house with a Special Forces Army t-shirt on ready to fight. And uh, my first match, man, I remember it was, I came out, I was super nervous, right? Um, got in the ring. Um, <laughs> dude, it didn't last long. It didn't last. And, and I, I, I would say it, yeah, maybe it was a lucky shot, but you hit anybody right here, they're going down. I don't matter. It doesn't matter how big you are. And I hit him. I hit him right there with a cross and he went down and yeah, it was a matter of seconds. And, um, it wasn't good when I said that was, you know, so the Marine host that got in the middle, he's like, Oh, you, you know, who, who, what, what unit are you in? Who are you? Right. And I'm like, I'm in the army. Special forces, and then you got booed. So then it was endless after that, right? Everybody wanted to fight me. But then uh, I saw a bigger gig right across the street. Uh, on the third floor, they had a, a fight night, right? And uh, Okinawans go there, and you don't need your commander's approval. And get this, if you win, it's $1,000. So that's where I fought. Right. So I fought in those underground matches and you know, who shows up is Marines. Right. So I'll come in and I shouldn't be there. Right. Totally shouldn't be there. I'm in the military, totally off limits place. And I'm seeing other Marines there. Right. And these Marines there. I'm like, yeah, these guys, man, I have respect for them. Right. So yeah, that was my, uh, my thing, man. And I would travel around the world. I would learn Sulat's, uh, Indonesian martial arts, uh, go to Philippines. I learn Extrema, our niece, uh, sticks and knives, impact weapons. Uh, as I travel around the world, I was learning guerrilla warfare, uh, jungle, jungle warfare. I would go up to Northern India and train with the commandos. So I was learning martial arts around the world, you know, and, uh, it was more than just hands. It was sticks, knives, weapons, tactics, you know, uh, yeah, I was very much into the fighting world. And then uh, what took me out of the fighting world was, you know, 9-11, the war. In between all of the tough man fighting, you end up going to Laos on your first major mission in charge. Can you talk about what made that mission a success and how one little girl impacted you? Yeah, so one of my first mission was Laos. All right. So I want to explain this in during the Vietnam War, you know, Americans, you know, we we're dropping landmines, hundreds and thousands of landmines through the rice paddies, jungle floors, you know, through the aircrafts. And um, that happened in the late 60s, 70s. Right. But now fast forward at 98, kids are playing in these jungle floors and they're losing their 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 limbs. They're losing their legs, their lives. So, uh, we were, the special forces were tasked to go out to these remote villages and, um, to link up with the villagers and to find, locate these landmines, to fix these landmines, mark them and dispose of these landmines. So we would go to these remote locations with, you know, our A teams and it was multiple locations and, um, we would link up with the locals and we would find uh, mark these landmines and show them how to dispose of them. But this particular uh, mission, there was a little girl uh, that came running up to me when I first landed in the village. And, um, you know, I pulled out candy. I gave the little girl candy. And, you know, she 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 didn't want candy. And she said something in her uh, language. And my linguist, my terp, uh, my, uh, he, he, he translated and he, he said, do you have a pen? pencil so i handed her you know my pen you know and uh, she kissed me and she ran off you know later on that day you know um that language told me the significance of that gift you know that pen i gave he said sir you know the pen the pen you gave that little girl yeah i'm like yeah <laughs> he goes sir you gave her an education you know, in this village, we don't have pens or pencils. We don't have paper. We don't even have a school for the children. 
You know, man, that impacted me so much. And you know, the first thing that came to my mind was my mother told me that if you have always, if you have an education, you'll never be oppressed. So that night, you know, um, we sent back support, asking for support for supplies and equipment to send over uh, because we end up building the children a school. And we rerouted a nearby uh, river so they can have running water in this village. And we find and we located these landmines and we taught those villagers how to dispose of those landmines. You know, can you imagine one human being, right? Can you imagine one human being that can help a village? How many generations have you touched? Mm. Right? So that's why, like, that was so impactful to me because I knew that. I knew that early on because my mother taught me these lessons. I think, too, also, I, I know nothing about the military. We don't have a family history of anything. But when I think of the military, I think of war and fighting and combat. But you don't think about little, a little thing like that that you just talked about. I mean, you're affected that whole village. But as you said, generation after generation after generation, the story will be told of you and your team coming there and, and you changed, you changed the dynamic of that area. I mean, it's, it's uh, it was really cool. When I read that, I was like, wow, you know, you never think about that stuff. Well, for, you, you might in the, as an experienced, uh, you know, in the military, but somebody was just a total layman about that stuff. I never even, I never, I guess I, I kind of thought that kind of thought the stuff was going on, but never even really realized the importance of it and the impact of it. Mm -hmm. It's so important. Every, every human being we touch, it's so important. Every word that we say impacts others. So important. You know, and so 9-11, I want to talk about that because everybody remembers that day, right? And if you don't remember, at least you, you know about it in history. It's a day echoed in history, a day that changed America forever. You know, for me, I was stationed in Okinawa, Japan at that point, and I was dating my wife you know, my future wife, she was going to Ohio State. And on 9-11, she was actually flying to see me in Japan. We, 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 we planned this for a long time, like around my missions and my deployments. We planned it this free time for her to break away from college and to fly and see me. 9-11. You know, I didn't hear from her for 24 hours. You know, back then it was no cell phones, right? I was, I was in classified areas. So I heard from her 24 hours later, flight shut down. Everything was shut down in America. I couldn't get out. Right. And I kept on seeing those planes flying into these twin towers over and over. I had on repeat, you know, and I realized at that point, you call what you want, faith, the universe, history, whatever. But I realized that that warrior at 13, I knew that I'm going to be used in this lifetime. My skills are going to be used. And that's Bushido. That's the way of the warrior. So when I saw that happen, I knew my destiny was going to be war. Right? And I knew this at a young age when I, when I walked the path of a warrior. But now it's playing out in front of me. So, uh, you know, George Bush Jr., he declared war on terrorism. It was a global war. Uh, we struck in Afghanistan. We struck around the world. I was stationed in Okinawa, Japan, saw a Ford deployed into southern Philippines fighting Abu Sayyaf. Abu Sayyaf is a terrorist organization um, funded by Al-Qaeda. So we went down in southern uh, Philippines uh, near Indonesia. Uh, in Basilan Island. Basilan Island, uh, half of the islands cut uh, extremist Muslims, and uh, half of them are Catholics. The Muslims, uh, the extremists will come, rape, kill, behead, uh, bombings, uh, ransom, I mean, you name it, right? So it's a terrorist organization. So we came down there to stop them. So I linked up with the commando force, the Filipino commando force. We work with them. Uh, the Burnhams uh, were captured. Uh, the Burnhams were a missionary group out of uh, Ohio. 
Um, they came over in the Philippines. They were captured, brought out into the jungles. A year, they were uh, missing in the jungles. We were part of that uh, hostage negotiation with the Filipino government. Um, we managed to get Miss Burnham back, but Mr. Burnham died during the, uh, the raid. Um, after the, my time in the Philippines, uh, we went. I went to the Middle East. Uh, I applied for uh, a highly classified uh, army assignment. Um, went went to Fort Bragg, the unit, and um, <laughs> so I was hired on originally as a combatives instructor. So. I was fighting in um, not only in Japan. I would go to Thailand. I'll fight in Thailand. I'll fight in Philippines. I'll fight anybody <laughs> anywhere. Right. So at this portion of my career, I was uh, part of a counter terrorist unit for deploy Okinawa, Japan, and we're doing counter terrorist ops with the Thai, Phil, uh, the Thai commandos. And on the weekends, I would fight Muay Thai matches. <laughs> um, there's a sergeant major who was going back and taking that classified assignment and he saw me fighting and he uh gave a business card to one of my best friends and he said have to call me so i called him special missions unit he said uh he made me an offer i couldn't refuse right go around the world fight right learn from the best go to war whenever you want to go around the world fight <laughs> sold right so uh so i i, I tried out for that assignment got a made it did uh combat as instructor went to war uh in between instructing um then i got fired off of that position because it was a uh, e9 position i was only e7 at that point and um then i went to a very classified reconnaissance uh troop within that that unit so that led me around the world out in and outside of combat zones, finding, locating the world most wanted men. Uh, we were very successful at it, um, targeting some of the men that were behind 9-11. Um, uh, I served there for eight years. Uh, man, I, t I just want to talk about marriage, right, and these type of assignments because marriage was very difficult. Right. I would be deployed in these, these combat zones or non declared war zones. Man, and I couldn't even speak to my wife because I was a different alias. You know, two lamb didn't exist. I worked under a different alias. So even if I was to speak to my wife, right, I would have to drive across town to a CIA safe house, go down to a skiff, a secure area, and then call my wife and just trying to hold a marriage together. You know, when you're working in these society and, and going to college, like I was still going to college. I was, I was doing operations and, you know, in, in Yemen at that point. And I would have to drive across town to, to get to a, a internet access to sit out my homework assignment. Right. It's just, I want to explain, like, even though we're fighting war zones, you're still, you're still a family man. Right. You're still a student. Right. In college, you're still, you know, you're still a human being. Right. So that, that was kind of difficult, right? Being able to deploy these combat zones, right? Seeing the worst in the world and coming back and trying to be a normal human being again. Right. You, you talked about, uh, you talked about in the book that there was one particularly, um, pretty, pretty brutal fight that you, you guys were in in Iraq that they tried to, uh, they kind of set you up, um, to try to ambush you. And and the story is and is very violent and and then everybody goes home and you log on to take a midterm, and when I read that it's kind of same vein you're saying now is, it's almost you're you're so lethal you're so deadly you're so you're so you know macho man and all this stuff that it's hard it's 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 easy to forget that you know you guys are just people right you're taking a midterm you got to call your wife you got to. It's, it's, um, it's almost like you're so, you're, you're so over the line alpha that people forget that you're human. You know what I mean? I'm human. And, and, and this is the thing is I think because I was so borderline alpha or even insane, it was because, man, I had a low self-esteem when as a child I was picked on 
Mm-hmm. You know, I was bullied. I, I I was facing genocide as a child, I was left for dead. So, man, I had something to prove. You know, and I had to do something in this world against all the evils that I perceive was evil. You know, what I perceive as evil was like human trafficking, right? Enslavement of others. Like I, man, I suffered that. Yeah. Right. So I have to do something about it. Like, you know, we have to do something about it. So, you know, that was just my path, but I, I'm not a macho guy. I just have a purpose. Yeah, I don't mean macho like your personality because that's one of the things I think that's so interesting about you is your depth because you're so much more than than just a you know the, a, I don't know a fighter. You you have so much more depth than that. But I guess again going back to like the uh, like the civilian point of view, when I think of Green Berets or, or Navy SEALs or people fighting, I just think about how they're doing in the combat. You don't think about the human aspect of it. That you know that there's there's so much more to life going on. Like you said, being a family man while, while deployed overseas and something so confidential, you can't even use your name. It's hard to even, you know, fathom that. So, you know, eventually war caught up with me because, you know, that you could weaponize war, right? So there's certain emotions that will enhance you in warfare. Hate is one of them. So I, I took up the, I guess you could say the sword of hate, right? I held it in my heart, hate. I lost teammates. I used that hate to go to war. Because, you know, if if you're engaged in a close quarters gunfight from, let's just say, five five yards, high-powered rifle, you, you're going to see a person's face explode. You're that close where you're going to smell death. So let me ask you this. When fear is there, what is stronger than fear? hate hate right so i embody that and and i tell you yeah that that works in war man but it bleeds out to your family it bleeds out to your heart and who you are as a human being you give hate to the world because that's what's in your heart now you know so after 15 years of war Right, around the world, you know, when I say it as, you know, not just the war in Iraq, Afghanistan, I went into Yemen, Libya, I went into, you know, the, the secret wars in Africa, the Horn of Africa. Right after you see that hate around the world, man, you know, I, I lost myself. And, I, and, and for me, I, I numb myself with uh, painkillers, you know, and that was the spiral downwards, right? So I, uh, I started numbing myself with painkiller. I caught a uh, a roadside bomb uh, during the Iraq war, and they prescribed me Percocet. And, uh, man, I, I was hooked. Right off the bat, I was hooked. And I tell you, it's a failed program anyways, right? Those painkillers, it's, it's a failed program. One pill, it's not enough. Two pills, not enough after a while, right? So I lived in that because I realized that numbed me mentally too. Lost teammates, Right, it numbed me from the horrors I saw from the world, the, the hate I felt in my heart. Like it numbed me, and I used it. But the one thing about that drug, man, it, it brings you straight to the bottom. You know, so at the tail end of my career, you know, uh, I was coming out of the Horn of Africa. I was coming out of South Africa, protecting our uh, former president. Um, it was Mandela's funeral, so I was there uh, working with the Secret Service. And I came out, and after that, I dropped my retirement. Um, and then that was when the real war started. You know, that's when the real war starts. People always think, like, the externals, right? So there's a portion, in I, I feel, in a man's life, right, where he has to develop himself spiritually, internally. Right? And that's a war, Right, that's a war because what happened if you were born in war and from your zero to seven years old, your program is nothing but hate, sin, murder. That's what you saw. That's in your program and your whole life. That's what you fought against. So it, darkness was in my heart, you know. And a lot of guys, they uh, after they get out of service, they you know they lose purpose, they lose they lose direction right they become drug addicts they, they they womenize they chase sin 
And for me, uh, when I got out, uh, man, I, I, I was going through it. But the first thing I had to do is I had to dump the pain meds. So I did. At 39 years old, you had spent 18 years in special ops. You had the self-awareness to realize that you had lost yourself and ended up in the warrior transition unit. You sign your release form and spiral into a deep depression. Until one day, a voice popped into your head. I was feeling sorry for myself. And I heard the world played out in my mind over and over my subconscious. And, you know, I was a drug addict, barely holding a marriage together, no purpose. And, you know, I would walk around a dark house. You know, my day would consist of me getting out of bed and walking to the couch. And that's the day. You know, I was lost. And then uh, I heard the world. I heard my mistakes. And then, man, one day I heard a different voice and it told me to get up. And I, I, I got up and I walked around this house and I have this what's called war room where I um, put all my war stuff, 27 countries, running with rebels and militants and stuff I collected, just war books. And, and somehow I was standing in front of the old writings of a ronin, Miramoto Masashi, the Book of Five Rings and Doku Do, the way Art of Walking Alone, right? Ronin. So I want to I want to explain to you what a ronin is. A ronin is a master samurai, and back in war stained periods, it was very dishonorable to be a ronin. You lost your way. So this ronin reminded me that I was looking for the answers in all the wrong places. You know, I was looking for all the answers externally. You know, I was looking for strength, knowledge. He said, everything is to be found within you. Look within, nowhere else. So I did. I dumped the pain meds and I sat in meditation and I heard the voices. I would say I sat in meditation for three years. Every day I would meditate at the same time as early in the morning. Uh, I would meditate at the same time. There's a reason why your your brain waves move slower at that point. It's easier to drop into delta brain waves or a theta. Um, so it's easy to reprogram your brain. I find early in the morning is the best time, but the first three years, man, di totally difficult. I, I had a lot of voices, right? Try sitting with your voice, try sitting in a quiet room and not think of anything, right? Just to anchor your breath, right? To be totally present. So I, I practiced that for three years and it brought me to a level of peace. Uh, I found my purpose in the way of being a teacher. So I started traveling around the United States, teaching law enforcement, military, law abiding citizens, the way of the warrior, you know, my, my weapon skills, my martial arts, all of it. I give it to what I perceive as the good in this world so they can protect themselves. Uh, we grew in popularity really fast. Um, across America. We became a national level trainer. I was publicized on YouTube, uh, websites. And that's how, you know, I, I met Bill Goldberg because uh, the History Channel saw my knife fighting skills and um, they wanted me to be on the show, uh, Knife for Death, right? So uh, I met Bill Goldberg there. Um, and then I would still travel around America teaching and training. Along with that, you know, my wife and I would run a company Right, uh, where we, we, we have, uh, a warehouse where we manufacture military, uh, textiling. I take my ideas. Ruthie had to step up and was your rock during that time. My wife, Alyssa, has had to be my rock at times in our life. Can you describe what that meant to you looking back on it? You know, in my twenties, when we first started, uh, I was the rock. I was the strength. I was the one. You know, that led the way they knew without a shadow of a doubt what needs to happen. And that, that led us to where we needed to be at that stage in our life. But when I found myself facing depression, PTSD, I was, I was trying to come off of, you know, drug addictions. Man, I was lost. I was trying to find my way back to God. You know, I didn't even know how. And my wife was the anchor. 
She was the anchor. She stepped up and became the strength when I was weak. Right. And I think that's what marriage is about. Right. We can't always be the strong one. Right. We, we have to take a step back and let our, our spouse step up for a little bit. Right. And let us heal. Right. Let us, let us handle what we need to handle so we can be this better man that we need to be. And she did. She allowed that space and time I needed for me to heal myself. I could be that man again, you know, because I lost my way. But, but she runs the business side of a Ronin, right? She, she has a master's degree in business accounting. She, I mean, that's her thing, right? I'm, I'm her brand, right? So, uh, <laughs> you know, she, you know, uh, when I say that, it's a lot of tactical companies. They use my image, my face, my brand, you know, to market guns, mm-hmm. market weapons, equipment, blades, whatever. I'm very well known in the tactical industry. And, uh, she was part of it the whole way through, man, right next to me in every meeting, every photo shoot. And I told her before all this started, uh, you know, before Ronan even started, I said, Hey, if I was to do this, would you go with me? You know, we've been, we've been apart our whole lives, right? Would you travel with me? And she would, she, she, she's right there when I'm teaching, she's right there. Right. So yeah, she's my anchor, man. You know, I'm very grateful. I love that you, you described her as your not so secret weapon. <laughs> Well, everybody knows when she steps in, you know, she, yeah. she, she looks at numbers and she looks at contracts, right? That's what she looks at, you know? So, uh, yeah, she's not my secret weapon. Everybody knows. <laughs> Ruthie then has the idea that you two should go to Japan with some other friends. The tour ends up being a life-changing event for you. Not because of the world-famous blade maker agreeing to make you one heaven and one earth sword but because of your trip to Spirit Rock. You were with a group of people, but Ruthie tells you to go ahead of the group and be present. Can you tell us what you experienced? You know, first you had to climb these steep stairs to get e- even in the entrance of that cave. You know, I want to describe this cave. So that island, the Kiyomoto, used to be been underwater, and it's a fishing island, right? So uh, the the jungle now is overgrown in triple canopy jungle. So it's made out, it's grown in coral reef, very slippery ground. Misashi back in uh, 1645, uh, he wrote the Book of Five Rings. Three years prior to that, he took a torch and walked through this jungle and found this cave. Climb up the cave through vines and then uh, there's a huge rock in there. Right, uh, that takes up almost the size of that cave, and also there was a an old boat that washed up into that cave. Remember, it's an old fishing village, right? So back then, so now when I walked up there, uh, it's very touristy. The floor is kind of covered for easy movements, but you will see that rock there. Um, you know, I was alone that morning. It was a misty morning. It was kind of rainy. It was kind of drizzly. It, it, what's really weird is that's a tourist site, but that morning we had the whole site to ourselves. And when I climbed up there, I took off, you know, my shoes and I, I climbed up on the rock and I, and I started dropping into my breath work, my, my meditation. And up until this point, I can only reach to a point where, well, where I met my monster. Right. So there was a, there's a stillness where, you know, if you practice meditation, there's a still point where you can reach to where you can feel whatever trauma that's stuck in there. Uh, but I couldn't get the voices out of my head up until that point. And meditation is about letting go of thought and sitting with emotion and breathing through the emotion. Through that, you let go. So, you know, that morning, man, I was able to let go because I met, I met that hate. You know, and he, you know, we, uh, and I let it go. I let go of that hate. And that changed my life because when I came back, it made me a better, man, it made me a better husband. It made me a better human being. It made me a better teacher, a warrior. And, and this is where I'm going with this is when, when, when it made me better, man, I started reaching out to God. Right. 
up and to then it was about letting go and about Buddha Magada and spirituality. But after I came back from Japan, it was about serving God. And I, I would say after a, a year of just working and trying to find my place again with God and trying to hear that voice, man, I found Jesus. And that's when things changed. You know, and, and that's where I want to go with this because, you know, I searched the world for it. I searched the world for it. It was right here the whole time. You know, and I want to send that message out to your, your viewers because that was what allowed me to break free from the hate of war. You know, and that's what's needed in this world right now because we live in hate. Right. We live in this materialistic world, externals. Right. You don't have to be that way. Right. The world is kind because we are kind. Right. My my dad is so happy right now. He's the only way I got him to do the podcast, too, was he said he had to be allowed to witness for, for Jesus in every episode because of all of the Ronin and the meditation and the Tibetan monks. I thought you might have been Buddhist. I didn't know. I thought you might have been, you know, have Buddhist or something like that. And so I was afraid this question was going to offend you. <laughs> I'm unconventional, right? Yeah. So I'm unconventional in my tactics on how I found God. But mm -hmm. when I found God and he led me to Jesus and I felt the presence of the Holy Spirit, I tell you that was life changing for me because it, it, it freed me from from a lot of the traumas I felt, right? And now, you know, I dedicate my life to Christ. I, I go to Bible study, I try to learn, and I try to live in that way because that's the truth, right? So is that, did you did you feel, did that, did that switch flip for you in that cave or did that just start you down the path, you think? It started me down the path. The switch is when I truly accepted my life as, you know, I was a sinner, right? And I accepted it and I, I felt, I, I accept all my imperfections and I just let it go to Jesus. And uh, that's when I felt the shift. Buddha and all the practice. So when I, when I say Buddha, because a lot of people say, you know, to you talk about Buddha, I still talk about Buddha. Buddha Magada was a human being that practiced letting go. And he taught nothing but compassion and love. That's what he gave to this world. Right? So he's a teacher in my eyes. Mm -hmm. He's a teacher, but Jesus is God. Right? Buddha taught me a practice of letting go, of emptying, emptying, emptying. But there's a point when you empty, you're just empty. You're a hollow thing that things can still enter you and influence you. But when, when I found the word... I don't empty anymore. I fill my cup with the word. And I tell you, that's what saved me, right? The truth. Because, man, if you empty, 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 there's still entities that still can enter and influence you. But when you fill your vessel with the, the word, what can enter you? Hmm. you? You're walking in the path of the Holy Spirit. You're trying to be Christ-like, right? So it took me a while to get there. And it took a lot of surrendering and dying, right? I died a lot of times. When I say that is, I don't know how many times I, I did psychedelics to die. I was trying to die to this ego, right? So I went, I went down the deep end, but what it led me to was God. I had a lot of trauma, man, right? A lot of trauma beyond... Um, I would say beyond a normal person. Yeah. Right? You had more trauma at, at I think sixteen than the more than normal person's entire life. Okay, so if I'm able to heal myself with this amount of trauma, and I told you what was what really healed me at the end, I told you what healed me, right? And I search, man, I search everywhere, right? I was not a Christian. I was not a believer of God. Right. I, I believe in the warrior code of Bushido and war. I believe in war and violence. Right. But there was a portion just like 
like your dad, Tim, you know, where, 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 where God took all the externals away from you. Where are you going to go? Here. And that's the biggest gift. The biggest gift is stop looking outside and turning this, these eyes on you. Right. That's the biggest gift. And, and the only way to do that is God puts you on his, your knees. To I'm I'm in in previous podcasts. I'm my my dad is I, I'm. Uh, it's one of the questions I actually wrote down for you. And I was going to ask you off camera, but I'll ask it with with uh, <laughs> I'll ask it with the listeners. I feel like I'm kind of in this place spiritually where I don't have near the trauma and things that you had to overcome and adversity and all that stuff. I've had an unbelievably blessed life, but spiritually, I feel like I'm almost like wandering. Like I'm trying to, I, I one of the, so the thing I literally wrote down is you talk about like things click for you at certain points. And I've asked my dad this, I've asked other guests we've had on. I haven't had a point where I all of a sudden it's like, Oh, there it is. I, I would like, my dad says to me all the time about religion. He's like, I respect all religions. Obviously he's Christian. He's like, but it would, I want you to have one. And if you're picking, you know, I'd like you to, to, pick Jesus and pick Christianity. And, and I said, like, I would love it if there was a, a button I could press to feel the way you're describing the way he describes it. If I could press a button and feel that I would, I would press it 10 times. Right. I wouldn't stop pressing it, but I haven't had a moment that like a flip, I flipped the switch and you two guys are good examples of in different, very different ways and different lives and different backgrounds. But you two have had so much adversity and so much, um, yeah, adversity and pain that, you know, part of me wonders is like, I'm almost, uh, maybe I don't have a flipping the switch moment. I'm, I'm, I'm not an atheist. I believe in God, but I, I don't know where from there. I don't know if, you know, I don't know if it's Christian or Jewish or what. I just, I believe, but I don't know Then that now, you know, now what? <laughs> that's kind of a, Anyways, well, I guess that's why I keep asking you about the. I'm not trying to uh, to get into too personal with your. No, no, I love I, lo I would love to talk about that. You know, there's a knowing, right? There's a knowing, as in a history book knowing. I know that you know war happened in Vietnam. I know World War II happened. I know, you know, I know certain dates. It's 1775, the Army. You know, the 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 uh, George Washington, right? The the Army was established. Like those are facts. Jesus died for our sins on a cross. That's a fact. But there's no relationship there. See, flipping the switch to me was deciding that I'm going to implement Jesus into my everyday life. And I'm going to walk in that path and I'm going to develop an everyday relationship with my Lord and Savior. Right? To admit that I'm a sinful and unperfect human being but I'm going to develop this relationship. So flipping the switch to me is a relationship. It's faith, right? Like, how do you build faith? Okay, let's just say, okay, Troy, I could shoot a human being with a nine millimeter pistol at 25 yards in the face. I'm confident with that. You confident I could do that? <laughs> I'm confident you could do that. I don't want to be there, but I'm confident you could do it. Why? Why are you confident? You never saw me do it, right? You, so you had faith in something that you never saw. Mm -hmm. And that's the faith you need to have in God and Jesus. And the only way you do that is you develop it every day. The reason why you believe that I could do that shot is you know my history, you know my background, and you know I teach it, right? Mm -hmm. But imagine something you don't see. How hard is it to have faith in something that you don't see? And that's the where that, that flipping the switch is, is it, it goes into, okay, I'm going to build a relationship with you. I'm going to walk with you. I'm going to follow you. Right. And that's, that's flipping the switch. And, and when you say you never had that aha moment, Troy, you're so young. <laughs> right. Like you're so young. And I hope you never, God doesn't put you down on your knees because it doesn't need to go there with you, right? Because if, if God puts you down on your knees, it's because you messed up and you were not living that path. But if you walk that path, one day 
if you keep on walking in faith, it's going to click. I promise you. And you'll have nothing but fulfillment and happiness. Every person in life will be taught a lesson. We all will one day lose all of our looks, all of our physical, and what do you have when everything else is stripped away from you? What's your dad? What your dad is doing? He's looking within, right? You will face a Troy. Age, age, right? Uh, you're going to lose your physical abilities one day, right? Yeah. Um, yeah. All of us are going to be put down on our knees, but do you have faith? No. And that's a relationship. I wrote this for you before we spoke today, but I'm going to read it anyway. Recently, you went to a healing facility at the suggestion of Sean Ryan. I'm a big fan of Sean and his show. Anyway, at the facility, you were given a regiment of hallucinogens under the care of doctors, I should add. Many times in your book, you mentioned your search for truth and I have to share my Christian faith with you. As I read your book, each time you said you were searching for truth, I got more and more excited at sharing the truth of Jesus Christ with you. But every time you encountered a kind and generous monk in your story, or a Buddhist, I would say to myself, maybe I'll learn something new about Buddhism when we talk with two, because I have been taught by Jesus himself not to judge others, and I respect other people's truth. But when I got to the end and that monster was still in your head, I had to say something. And Sean Ryan was in on it too. In his last few shows, he has proclaimed he is a Christian now. Think about it and email me or read anything by C.S. Lewis. Again, I wrote that as a question for you today, but it's not relevant now because you found your own path to God and I'm so happy for you. Ooh. So he, he had all that before before he knew you, <laughs> you were Christian. So he's, it's, it's, uh, yeah, it's really important to him. Obviously you can but see that. Yeah. I, I, I want to talk about, because I'm a, a well-traveled man, right? I, I have, I have lived in villages. I have seen stuff in villages from the, from the hunter gatherer type of people that explains there is God. Right. And every religion is a relationship on how we deal with God or our communication of God. The thing about Buddha, and I want to explain this is, uh, Buddha Magadha was a normal prince. He was a prince that gave all his riches away. He wanted to live in suffering because he felt compassion for the people. And he sat underneath a boga tree and he, he did breathing techniques until he let go. And he dedicated his whole life to teaching compassion. And letting go. And Buddhism was not even meant to be a religion. It was a practice of letting go. It was later, in, in fact, Buddha was concerned that it was going to be a religion. But 200 years after his death is when they made it a religion. Hmm. Okay. And I, I searched Buddha because uh, letting go. Right. And I, I will tell you the physical practice of letting go. What that teacher taught was true. But the thing is this, when you let go and you don't accept Jesus, you don't have the Holy Spirit. And this is a spiritual war and the armor and weapons are different. My weapons of war on the battlefields is night vision, lasers and machine guns and suppressed weapons. The battlefield that I wear is the armor of God. And my weapons is sort of the, the shield of faith and the sword of the spirit. Like I know the weapons in this physical, in this spiritual world. It's a, it's a, it's a spiritual war. And only those are willing to be brave enough to look within and fight this war. And you understand that the devil do exist, right? And is it is our responsibility to to find our way back to Jesus and and, and our salvation, you know? So. That was my path, guys, you know, and how I found Jesus. Um, but I will let you know, my path was through the indigenous people, through through jungles, in the Himalayas. I searched, you know, and uh, in the end, Tam and I agree. <laughs> yeah, we, we had a guest on who who, uh, who compared. He, he went through the Sudan Civil War. He lived through it. I don't know if you ever heard of the Lost Boys of Sudan. He was he was one of the Lost Boys, and 
he's very was very uh, spiritual, very Christian. He said that he compared my my dad's story to like a modern day Job, where God took yes. all the riches away from Job. He yes. said in my dad's case, he took all the physical yes. abilities away. And yeah, I had this is another very very personal antidote, but I always had this. Um, I always had this uh, 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 argument sake that, you know, I'm, I'm a know-it-all or whatever, 18-year-old philosophy major at, at college. And I, I heard this, ar- you know, I heard these arguments and, and it was about the one that I always stuck with was Noah's Ark. And with Noah's Ark, I always would say to people like, here's the thing about Noah's Ark. I would try to take the by like the words in the Bible, like very literally. And if you, and then I'm like, Oh, if we find one thing, then it's all. And I never, somebody said to me more recently, like it's, it's not, it's, it's, it's supposed to be symbolic and it's the stories and it's the lessons. If you're reading it literally to this, you know, in this person's interpretation, he said, you're missing 99% of the book is really about what's, you know, you have to go deeper. And he said, uh, so I said to him, you know, again, in my, uh, my arrogance, I, I say, I'm like, look, I can't, I can't, it's hard for me to even get to it because Noah's Ark. If I saw somebody floating by on a raft with two animals and I called one of my buddies and said, Hey man, this guy just floated by with a, with a bunch of animals. He would call another one of my buddies in a game of telephone in 10 minutes. We'd say there were two of every animal <laughs> on this raft. Mm-hmm. And he's like, you're missing the whole thing. He said, you, you're on Noah's Ark right now because your your family's flood it's not a literal flood he's like your family's flood is your dad's health and your i'm very involved with my with my parents and and my family and we're very close and i've i've uh i'll, I'll pat myself on the back i've stepped up and, and helped my parents with a lot of things um because of my dad's health that i wouldn't wouldn't have you know wouldn't have had to do but it's easy for me to do cuz he would, he has done it for me my, me my whole life still does it today and would do it if the tables were turned um, but the reason I bring that up is he's like, you were, you know, in, in Noah's Ark, there's the story of the flood and, and, you know, you have to help build the bow and how you, how Noah's sons treated him during the flood and after the flood, it's all part of the story. And he says that to me, and this is going to sound so fake, but I have no reason to make this up. I'm uh, my mom's Jewish. And so we grew up, they're called mezuzahs. They look, uh, I don't know. There's small little things that hang outside your door and it's a, it's a Jewish tradition. And, and, um, my daughter is five and we're at my parents' house, right? Where I was, grew up. And my daughter says, Hey, why doesn't, uh, uncle Ty, a younger brother, why doesn't he have a mezuzah on his door? And we're talking about that. And she's like, well, what, what was your, she didn't know mezuzah. She said, why doesn't he have this thing on his door? Anyways, um, she's like, well, which one's yours? And we go over to it too. I walk past this thing from age zero to 18 every single day. And when I went to college, I would come home all the time. I would sleep in my parents' house all the time. I'm a total homebody. I, I lived there for, um, you know, at parts with my wife and kids. Even I, I bounced in and out of my parents' house like it's a, like it's a holiday inn. But this thing, my, the, the mezuzah on my door is of Noah's Ark. I, I had no clue. And I saw the thing. I'm like, you've got to be kidding me. And my mm-hmm. wife's like, Come on, you don't think that's a sign? Like, anyways, so it's a it's a journey I'm on right now, and hearing you know hearing from you guys is is I really respect it and and appreciate it, and it there's something I know that I'm I know that there's something there. I just have to I just have to uh, keep looking looking within. To your point, stop looking externally. Now on to our final word segment, where we ask our guests a few rapid fire questions. What was the happiest moment in your life? The day I met my wife. What is the biggest adversity you faced? War. What are you most excited about? Just living out my life with my wife, yeah. The name of our podcast is Nothing Left Unsaid. Do you have anything you want to say? No, I just want to say thank you for having me on. Uh, I, I would say, you know, kind of hear those words and what, where my journey took me. You know, where my journey took me, and it took me to Christ. So it doesn't matter the journey, as long as we get to the top of the mountain. Tulam, it has been a pleasure and an honor to talk to you. You are living the American dream. By your own incredible efforts, you have made yourself a modern-day samurai, a ronin. Your mission was to free the oppressed, and you certainly have done that. May God continue to bless you and your family. And lastly, thank you. Thank you for your service. 
Thank you for your sacrifice and thank you for making the world a better place. Thank you. To this this episode, uh, coincidentally, is going to come out actually on 9-11. I know that was a pivotal moment, as you said, in history, but um, is there anything you'd want to talk about you know, specific to 9-11 for you? You know, I, I just want to personally say, you know, 9-11 changed my life. It changed the world. It changed America. And, you know, the, the way that we interact with the world, uh, our safety, our freedoms. So 9-11 to me was a, a pivot moment in my life. And it, first, it spun me into 15 years of war, but also it, it showed me the world and the cruelties of the world, right? So when, when I say about 9-11 is, you know, God bless God bless all of the victims that died that day on 9-11 and know that, um, man, we, we did bring the fight to them and uh, we tried to bring them to justice. Awesome. Thank you, too. Thanks for the podcast. Thank you for your service. Um, it's really, really been awesome talking to you. And, and uh, you know, like I said, when I'm next time in Colorado, I'm, I'm going to shoot you a text. Oh, you know what, too? The last question I almost forgot. Uh -oh. Every every this is how we got connected. At the end of every podcast, we ask our guests, we say, hey, um, the podcast, we didn't want it to be just about football or just about ALS or just about family or religion. We wanted it to be a really good mix of, of different people. And uh, Bill Goldberg, he recommended you. So now I got to pass the question to you. Who are a couple of people you know uh, personally that you would recommend uh, we reach out to to see if they can get on the podcast? You know, I recommend my my uh, my bro Trung. He uh, he's he's another Vietnamese uh, guy. He was an airborne ranger, and then he went and became SWAT. Uh, he's still active. He's going around America teaching. He has a brand called We Go Home, where he makes supplements. Jacked Asian guy, uh, Vietnamese. <laughs> so very, uh, you know, he's very well respected in the community, and uh, love for you guys to talk to him. That would be awesome too if you could connect us, and uh, hopefully we can get him on. Thanks so much again. Yes, absolutely. Today's episode is also brought to you by Nurse Corps, the heart of healthcare. This is the home healthcare company that I personally use. I also wanted to give a special thanks to all my amazing nurses. For more information, go to nursecorps.com. I want to thank my partners at Barclay Damon for supporting this podcast, Nurse Corps for their truly amazing team, and of course, Eleven Labs for their incredible technology. If you like today's episode, a free way to support the podcast is to subscribe and share it with friends. Thank you. A significant amount of these sponsorships go to TackleALS.com. For cutting-edge ALS research at Massachusetts General Hospital, if you want to make a contribution, go to TackleALS.com.